doesn't deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. So we see that the world and God don't often agree on how to be happy and how to be successful in this life. Happiness is a world of pursuit. Friends, when you cannot seek, pursue, and find happiness, and that's why you haven't found it yet, because you can't seek and find happiness. God blesses us with happiness. And who does God bless with happiness? Psalm 119 2 says, Happy are they that keep his testimonies, that seek him, that seek him with a whole heart. I forgot to say a lot of you are writing that I did make an outline that I'll give to you afterwards. It has all the scriptures in there. But the scripture says, seek God. Seek him with your whole heart, and that's where happiness is. So, and the Bible goes on to tell us what we should be seeking. Matthew 6, 33, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these other things shall be added unto you. And Jesus goes on to say in the same passage, ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened. But he's still talking about the kingdom of God, not carnal matters. So I said all of this to say that our purpose here is not to pursue happiness. So let's ask God again. God, why did you make us? Now you can turn to Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, if you have your Bible. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. And it says, For in him were all things created in the heavens and upon the earth, things visible, things invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things have been created through him and unto him. So this verse tells us that God created us for his purpose. It's not the other way around. People often think that God is here to help us fulfill our purpose or what we think our purpose should be. Think about all the music awards and the um, actors awards. And the first thing they always want to say is, giving God all the honor and praise who has blessed me with these talents. And we seem to recognize that our blessings and our talents do come from God. But when I look at those music awards, I think, if God blessed you with those abilities, I don't think he wanted you to use them to promote immorality, promote violence, and disrespect women. That is not using God's gifts to fulfill his purpose. Look at your own lives. We all are blessed with many talents and many blessings, but God gave you those talents to fulfill his purpose. So God has blessed you with a beautiful personality, and you have many friends out in the world. God expects you to use that great personality to draw those friends to him. If God has blessed you with organizational skills, your house is immaculate. You organize, you go into the community and the schools, and you can organize all kinds of fundraisers, yet the youth are disorganized in church. The ladies are disorganized because you are not using your talent to promote his purpose in his kingdom. Many people are scholars. God has blessed you with a great mind. You learn, you pick up, you go for your bachelor's, your master's, your PhD. You go back to school to get another master's. Yet, you don't study the Bible. How is that possible? You don't put God on the back burner. Focus all your attention on your career, your family, yourself. And then thank God for helping you become who you are today. Being successful by worldly standards and fulfilling your God-given purpose are two different things. Think about it for a minute. Success by worldly standards means very little to God. Worldly success has nothing to do with your spiritual purpose. And I'm not saying that you cannot be successful in this world and fulfill God's purpose. My problem is in the order of your priority. God's purpose for you must be your utmost and most important priority. This is the driving force for everything that you do, the thing that you are most passionate about. Why would denying God for any length of time, for any reason, be pleasing to him? 
know it's up in here, well, that I understand. But that rationale does not work in any other situation. You try going to work and you tell your boss, you know, I took off last week because I wanted to pursue other interests and I didn't really check with you because you understand, don't you? <laughs> or you go to your teacher and you say, I know you asked for science homework, but math is easier, so I turn that in. You understand, don't you? But we use it all the time in the church. God, I know I need to be in service, but I've got a big project due on Monday. You understand, don't you, God? Or I know I need to study and pray more, but American Idol's on. I'll do that later. You understand, don't you, God? Okay, God is not our Father to help us fulfill what we think our purpose is. We are here to fulfill His purpose. And I know we still haven't gotten to what is God's purpose for us. And this is because I really wanted to spend a little bit of time helping us get to this point and agree that it is not about us. It is all about Him. Now turn with me please to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10. You have your Bible, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10. And it says that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. So this lets us know that God has the ultimate goal. The purpose for creation, the purpose for why we are all here, God wants to gather us all to heaven with him one day, those who are found to be righteous and in Christ. Jesus had a part to play in this plan. In John 17, verse 4, Jesus said, I have glorified you on earth. I have finished the work that you gave me to do. Jesus' purpose while on earth was to glorify God, to have them to point the world to God. And then, where do we fit in? In John 14 and 12, it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believes on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. So God has a plan, a goal, to reach, get us all to heaven with him one day. Jesus' purpose in that plan was to glorify God. And then John 14 tells us, if you believe in me, you're going to continue the work that I started. If Jesus' purpose was to glorify God, our purpose, while on earth, is to glorify God. There, I finally said it. That is your purpose. Your single focus for everything you do is to give God the glory. Now, I'm, I'm one for definitions. Because if you tell me I need to do something, I really want to know what exactly does that mean? What does that look like? What does it be clear? I want you to have a very clear understanding of what it means to give God glory. So I spent some time working on some definitions and came up with some. The first is, to reveal, to give God glory means to give, to reveal God's honorable position in your life. To give God glory is to reveal God's honorable position in your life to others, to others. So the trick here is, does God hold an honorable position in your life? You cannot reveal God's honorable position in your life to other people, the people around you, if he doesn't trust hold an honorable position in your life. The next, to give God glory is to highlight God in what we do, what we say, and what we think. To highlight God in everything that you do. How do we do that? First of all, to make sure that the things that you're doing and saying and thinking and how you're asking is within God's will for your life. That God will be pleased with those things. That's how you highlight God. To give God glory means to be a representation of His power to the world. To be a representation of God's power to the world. That is how we give God glory. Think about your life. What are you representing? Who are you a representation of as you go through your daily life? Everybody who sees us should recognize that we are a representation of God's power to the world. And the last one, to give God glory is to give God credit for everything that is good. Everything else that the Bible instructs us to do, it is to help us be better at 
representing him to the world. We study to show ourselves approved, to give an answer to every man that asks, and that gives God glory. We fellowship with one another, not just to kick the breeze, but to shoot the breeze, but to <laughs> encourage each other to give God glory. The purpose is a spiritual purpose when we get together in fellowship. It's to encourage each other to go walk on this Christian walk. We pray for things that will help us give God glory. In John 14 and 13, John chapter 14, we already read verse 12, which said, He that believes on me, the works that I do shall do also. Verse 13 of the same text says, Whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Now some take this scripture and run with it. See, God said, anything that I ask for in his name, he'll give it to me. If I ask for riches, he'll give it to me. If I ask for a, son, a, a husband, he's going to give it to me. But we fail to focus on the second part of that verse. He will answer your prayer if what you're asking for will give him glory. So if you ask for God to help you cheat on your taxes, that's not revealing God as something that's on the If you ask for more work, you want to work overtime, but that time takes you away from God, God may not answer that prayer because it's not giving God glory. You want a better paying job so you can, you know, buy that BMW. That is not glorifying God. Now, in contrast, if you ask for more free time, because you say, God, I want more time to study your word. I want more time to visit the sick. That gives God glory. If you ask for a better paying job because you want to be able to give more to God, you want to be able to help support a family in need, God listens to those kind of prayers. So when you go to God in prayer, ask yourself, how will this thing that I am asking for glorify God? How will this thing I'm asking for highlight God's power in my life? And you can't come up with a Don't be surprised if your prayer is not being answered. We give glory to God, not for God's sake, but it's for the world's sake. So the world will come to recognize God and his plan for their life. God is not egotistical. He's not sitting up there saying, yes, praise me, give me all the praise. It's not for him. God doesn't need us to praise him. God was great before we came into this world, and when we leave, he will still be great. Okay? Um, we give God glory and praise first to help us remember where our salvation is. It's in Christ. And second, to show the world the way to their salvation, which is also in Christ. It is a privilege. It is an honor to be able to give God glory. It is a gift of love from God, knowing that we humans, we need to be reminded continually of our purpose. And you know, the definition that really hit home for me of giving God glory, which really made me stop and think, was, to give God glory is to give God credit for everything. I started thinking about that, thinking, and I, how often do I just accept a compliment and say thank you? How often do I accept credit for something when the praise and the credit really belongs to God? And then I felt scared and sad, and I thought, oh my God. How many opportunities have I missed to give you glory because I took that glory away from you and basked in my own glory? Think about all the compliments. Marcia, you did a good job today. Thank you. Marcia, you look nice today. Thank you. Marcia, the kids are so nice. Thank you. But And then I really, I thought, oh, my father, I am so sorry because all of these are opportunities that we have to point another person's attention to God. We should not be accepting praise and credit for ourselves. Why? Because everything that we have that might have a compliment, God gave us that thing. Whatever you have that is good, that is beneficial, God blessed you with that thing, and he deserves the praise and the honor, not us. Okay, now those answers would come out differently if I was really focusing on giving God glory. Someone says, Marcia, good job in class today. Isn't God's word wonderful? Yes. Marcia, you look nice today. I thank God every day that he allows me to wake up and see another day. Marcia, your kids are so sweet. You know, I thank every child is a blessing. And I look to him for direction on how to raise them. Now, when, what is the last thing I left on that person's mind? It's God, not 
me, there's nothing about me that deserves praise and honor. Whatever we have, whether we have beauty or clothes or a job or money or a car, it is from God above and he deserves the praise, not us. So think about it. And I stopped and I thought, oh, what an eye-opener. Take a moment to examine yourself. Can you think of opportunities that you miss to glorify God by taking credit? Yourself. Think about at home with the family when someone says, Oh, this tastes good, thanks. You did a good job. What do you say? Think about at work. Someone says, You did a good job on this project. What do you say? Think about there among your sisters and brothers in Christ. What do you answer to them? You no, know, just say, Thank you, and go on your own way. These are opportunities that we miss to point another person's attention to God. And it is really staggering to think how little we really give God credit throughout our daily lives. Remember, to give God glory is to give Him credit. And this takes action on our part. Now, I have heard all my Christian life that we don't actually have to mention God. We just have to live our life in a Christian manner, and that gives God glory. But you know, when you think about that, most people live their life in a Christian manner, whether they're Christians or not, because most people are morally good, and they don't steal, and they don't do all these things, and they don't curse. So what makes us stand apart from them? There's nothing wrong with opening your mouth and saying something and mentioning God's name to the people around you. In order to truly give God glory, you must take self out of the picture. Forget about how uncomfortable you feel talking about God. Forget about you might be labeled at work. Forget about you might lose some friends along the way. Okay, and 2 Timothy 3 and 12, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If you want to follow Jesus, expect to feel some pain and some suffering along the way. It hurts to change. It hurts to break out of the mold. It hurts to strive to be something better, something different. The Bible also talks about other situations in which we have opportunities to give God glory. In worship, our purpose in worship is to give God glory. In Psalms 86 and 9, all nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship before thee, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. During worship, our purpose is to give God credit, not ourselves. Not to bring attention to us in any way. We are there to praise God for the honorable position that He holds in our life. And therefore, our presence and service, our demeanor, our attitude, our dress, our songs, our prayers, our message, everything. The purpose is to give God glory. We need to bring God in our minds on Sunday. When you're looking forward to Sunday because you want to wear that new dress you bought, God is not the focus of your mind. When you went to the assembly and you said, you know, I'm sit on that pew and I don't want to sit over there because I might have to talk to Sister So and so. God is not on your mind. Okay, the songs that we sing, the songs we sing, the purpose of singing is to praise God. It is to praise His goodness, to highlight Him, to exalt Him, not us. Many of our songs, church, talk about how horrible life is here for us. And one day when we get to heaven, life will be better. Trials, dark on every hand, tempted and tried, woe is me, everybody will be happy over there. What is the purpose? What is the focus of these songs? There are songs in our book that don't even mention God. How can you say that you are exalting God if He is not even in? Song. Contrast those songs to Hallelujah. And you're the one, and you're the only one. You see the difference. These songs put our mind in the right place where we can exalt and know that God is the most high king. We're not focusing on ourselves and our rewards, and hopefully one day we'll receive a mansion, a robe, and a crown. And that's not our purpose in singing. Our prayer. We are to pray for one another. The Bible instructs that. But sometimes our prayers can get downtrodden with the sick and the bereaved and the 
traveling and the shedding and what we need and what we want, we very little on what God wants from us. Where is the focus of our prayers on raising ourselves to a spiritual level, on focusing on giving Him praise, on focusing on what we need to improve spiritually? Yes, we should pray for one another, but we, but our prayers are too, they're not balanced, they're too heavy laden with carnal needs and wants and depression, and not very little on raising God up, on raising ourselves up to the spiritual level that God knows we can be on, if we depend on Him, not on ourselves. So sisters, make sure that when you're in worship, that your mind is not focused on yourself and your problems, but your mind is focused on giving God the glory. Another opportunity that the Bible talks about is if we have an opportunity to give God glory, we are suffering. 1 Peter 4 and 16, it says, Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, <coughs> let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on his account. And I want to point this out because many people take a lump all suffering together and say that we are suffering as a Christian, when often we are suffering because of the consequences of our behavior, not as a Christian. If you're suffering, if you didn't take care of yourself growing up as far as um, eating and exercise, and you're not suffering with a lot of physical illness because of that, you're suffering due to the consequences of your behavior. All suffering cannot look together and say suffering as a Christian. If you have children out of grandma and you're now struggling to care for those children, you're suffering as a consequence of your if you are in a bad relationship, you chose that reason. That was the consequence of your decision. Okay. If you chose partying over education, you now can't make any meat. That is the consequence of your behavior. Okay, there's a difference between suffering for Christ and suffering because of our behavior. God does not save us from the consequences of our behavior. God just gives us the artillery that we need to help us through those situations. Being a Christian, it gives you prayer. It gives you a relationship with God. It gives you your brothers and sisters in Christ for support. But being a Christian doesn't save you from the consequences of your behavior. And I think it's a very important point because often we ask, why me? Why am I suffering? Often the answer is we are in this predicament because of our behavior, our decision. And when we ask, when you can ask, why me? Why am I suffering? And the, and the answer comes back, because I'm a Christian, then you're suffering for Christ's sake. When your heart is heavy because you've fallen into temptation, you're now struggling to not fall again, you're suffering for Christ's sake. When you're passed over for a promotion at the job because you refuse to work overtime on Sunday, you're suffering as a Christian. Well, Marcia, you might ask, what does this point have to do with giving God glory? And how do we fulfill our purpose in either case, whether we're suffering as a Christian or suffering as a consequence of our behavior? And it all starts, it starts in your mind. If you say in your mind that I am that you are suffering as a Christian, or you're really suffering due to the consequences of your behavior, then you begin to ask, God, when are you going to stop my suffering? When are you going to heal my body, even though I was the one who abused it? When are you going to pay my creditors, even though I was the one who ran up the charges? When are you going to make this man treat me right, even though I was the one who chose him? We are looking to God to fix our mistakes. We're looking to God to save us from the consequences of our behavior. And when we don't feel any relief, we begin, to, we begin to blame God, and our relationship with Him becomes distant. We feel He doesn't love us because He doesn't answer our prayer. Our view of God becomes skewed. And when you, when, and, and we don't see Him as righteous, holy, and full of goodness, but when in your mind you start having negative feelings towards God, you need to stop. 
and look at your own self. Because there's nothing negative about God. God is love. God is truth. God is holiness. God is righteous. When you start having bad feelings, it's your mind that's off. God has not left. Your mind has changed in that situation. Okay, so we need to, and when our view is off, we say to ourselves, how can I give God glory when he won't answer my prayer? How can I give God glory when he won't relieve my suffering? How can I glorify God who knows his child is hurting and he won't do anything about it? The sisters, you cannot climb the ladder to spiritual maturity with a boulder of misconceptions on your back. You cannot fulfill your purpose to give God glory when you subconsciously hold God responsible for not protecting you from your suffering. Remember I said it all starts in the mind. What statement are you making to yourself because of your circumstances? Any statements that you make in your mind must be validated by Scripture because it's because God's word is the only truth that there is. In John 17 and 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is true. That is the only truth that exists. Anything that you make up in your mind, like I said in the beginning, that's from your mind. You can't, just as you can't define what your purpose is, because that's based on your own experiences, the beliefs that we come up with as to why we can't serve God, those come from our mind too, and therefore that's false. It's a lie. You are lying to yourself. Proverbs 16 and 2 tells us all the ways of a man, they can claim in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirit. So when you say to yourself, I can't, I can't give God glory for whatever reason you put behind there. Because I was raised by a single mother, because I had an alcoholic father, because I was adopted, because I was born with a defect, because I abused drugs, because I'm sick. Whatever you put after that, that is not substantiated by Scripture. Scripture gives no reasons why you can't glorify Him. And therefore, these beliefs that you're holding for why you're not a stronger Christian, why you're not moving along this Christian walk, they are all lies. Because they are not based on God's Word. What does the Bible say? In Luke 9 and 62, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back, which is for the kingdom of God. Meaning once you step out there and decide to become a Christian, you cannot look in your past and now give a reason as to why you now can't serve God. If you do that, you are not fit for the kingdom of God. So back to my point about suffering. If you believe that God does not love you as much as another because you are still suffering, when you see others who are not suffering, this belief is a lie, and it is not based on God's truth. But what is the truth about suffering when it relates to consequences of our behavior? When you think about it as parents, why do we allow our children to suffer consequences? So they'll learn. So they won't go that way again. So that they will grow. So that they will mature. That's why we allow them to suffer. And we recognize that in a parental role as a good thing. We praise our parents for allowing us to suffer certain things. And the Bible talks about that too in relation to God. In Hebrews 12, verse 5 through 8. And we've read it, I won't go over it, but basically it says the same thing. Just as, as parents we allow our children to suffer consequences, God also allows us to suffer consequences so we can grow. And we can easily recognize that our parents allow us to suffer consequences for our own good, and we praise our parents for that how much more opportunity to give God glory because he is active in our lives even and especially when we're suffering. He is allowing us to suffer consequences because he knows that if we endure we will be stronger. We will be more holy. In Hebrews 12 and 11 it says for the time being no discipline brings joy but it seems grievous and it's painful but afterwards it yields a peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. It produces a harvest of fruit which consists in conformity to God's will and purpose in thought and action, resulting in right living and a right standing with God. So think about it. Why does God care if we develop in holiness a fruit of righteousness? Why does he care? Remember, God's goal is to receive us all home in heaven. We cannot go to heaven if we don't grow spiritually. We cannot go to heaven being a meat. 
mediocre Christian, a stagnant Christian, a good enough Christian, going through the motions, that will not get you to heaven. You must be growing and striving and moving towards spiritual maturity. And God loves us so much that he will allow us to suffer so we can grow. He will allow us to fall to temptation so that we can grow. He will allow us to feel grief, to feel sadness, and frustration, humiliation, stress, so that we will desire something better, a relationship with him, a home with him one day. So ladies, our purpose is to give God glory. Our drive to run this Christian way is fueled by our desire to give God glory. A purpose-driven woman is the woman who pushes herself and strives to give God glory in every aspect of her life. And we have so much to give God glory for. If God never did another thing for us, we would not run out of things to thank Him for, to praise Him for, and, and to give Him credit for. And yet, in spite of ourselves, He continues to be an active part of our life. What an awesome, awesome God that we serve. In spite of my sins, my imperfections, my poor attitude, my selfishness, my lack of focus, God still wants to be in my life. So why, God? Why me? Why do you want to dwell inside of me? And it doesn't matter how much you beat yourself up for being undeserving of God's love or unworthy of God's sacrifices or unable to really comprehend all of God's majesty and all of God's holiness. God loves you. And those, that simple phrase, God loves you, it doesn't change no matter what things in your mind. God loves you. And that fact really ought to drive you to fall to your knees and ask for forgiveness for all the times you forgot about him, all the times you ignored him, all the times you refused to obey him, all the times that you did not give him credit, all the times that you did not recognize him this honorable position in your life. And when you're down on your knees, sisters, don't ask for strength because you have all the strength. You have God's power in you. There is no more strength. You need to ask for desire to serve Him. Ask for motivation. Ask for zeal. Ask for commitment. Ask for perseverance to run this Christian race. And when you get up from your knees, be totally driven to live your life for God, to fulfill your God-given purpose on this earth, to give God all the glory, all the praise, all the 